Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical house plants. You might also be able to see it in front of me today. So the plant that I'm going to be reviewing today, and this is obviously going to be part of the plant review series, is a begonia for a change. And it's a begonia that's usually quite small. I have had mine, <laughs> I've had mine for a few years. I'll put it up on the top as well. I think I might have had this begonia three or four years, but the title will have it for sure. And obviously this is multiple propagates, but we'll get into that in just a moment. But yes, the begonia that I'm gonna be talking about, and I'll bring it in a bit closer, and I will try to insert clips throughout this video because this is a particularly difficult begonia to film at a distance because it does look a bit wispy and a bit kind of, I'm looking at it in the camera and it almost looks like it could be bamboos. Uh, but yeah, and please excuse the crispiness. I have tried. You cannot see the pile of brown leaves down the bottom because this lives at the very back of my shelf. So it doesn't get a lot of TLC very often, but we'll get to that in just a moment. The begonia is the begonia amphioxus. So let me put this back down and let's move on to some ground rules. Now for the people that are coming back, welcome back. It was nice to have you. You know as always that down in the progress bar you can skip to your favorite section. And for the newbies, welcome to the slight insanity that is this plant review series. And this is the bit that really does need the kind of ground rules really. So with a lot of my plants there is no way that this review is going to be unbiased. There isn't. I mean it's it's my review of my plant in my collection, in my growing conditions, which is in a conservatory in the UK and whatever that might mean, both in terms of heat, light, coldness in the winter, especially now with the energy crisis going on. But these are just my experiences with this plant. This is what I have seen and what the, the whole kind of experience has been over the years what I've struggled with, what the successes have been, all of these things. But I do encourage you, if you've also got this plant and you wanna share your review, please do so down below. Generally, it's a good idea to give as much information as possible because if you'd imagine it would be yourself watching a video like this and you didn't have this plant and you were trying to see what other people were talking about, give as much information as you can but, or as much as you want really so kind of lights humidity levels watering all of these things that might be important to somebody kind of getting to grips with potentially wanting to buy this plant or they've just bought this plant just because it will make their lives a bit easier in terms of kind of coming to grips with what this plant might require to thrive in different people's environments. And I think that's always important to remember. Just because something will grow with my conditions, with the care that I give it, if you can't provide exactly the same thing, yours might not, basically. So it's good to see how things do in different conditions. But I've prattled on for far too long about this section. Let's move into the first topic. So the background with this plant, and I'll bring it in a bit closer, and before I do that actually, let me insert a photo here from my plant care app, and there you should be able to see what this plant looked like when I first got it, but let me bring it in a bit closer and you can see a bit more about what makes this plant truly special. And obviously you can see there is more than one stem in here. There is janky support sticks for the win, and you can see the, the less pretty side in the back. You might also be able to see that it is in an aroid soil mix, and hopefully that is coming across. But this is a bone dry, and I'll come on to care and what people used to say about this plant in just a moment. But essentially the background on this was that, I'm trying to like put it so you can still see it in shot. What you cannot see is this is sitting on top of a table and on top of two different pots and it's still not reaching high, high up enough. But I mean, you can see the kind of size of this plant. This is not a plant that I found in my care, especially after how many years of growing it, that will grow particularly tall. It can do, it can get relatively tall as long as you give it its support because it is a cane begonia. Rather than a rhizomatous begonia, this is a cane begonia. So with this one, the story was that I'd never heard of this specific begonia before. 
However, I had seen it, I think, for the first time, and this is going a while back on Betsy Begonia's YouTube channel, and it was something that she was trying really hard to find. I think since then, and we'll talk about this in availability, these plants, at least here in the UK and in Europe, I would imagine, have become a bit more available. But the thing that she really liked about this, and the thing that drew me to it as well, is the fact that this plant almost looks like it could be toxic or, yeah, or toxic or poisonous, not poisonous, po I always get these wrong. Poisonous is an animal, toxic is something that if you ingest it, it could cause you harm, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, this is a plant that does look like it could be a bit lethal, basically. So the reason why I like this, and I used to have uh, poison dart frogs, this has similar kind of vibes. It's kind of, it's almost kind of telling you, do not, come anywhere near me, I might be dangerous, basically. And it's because of those leaves, and let me see if I've got a leaf that I can maybe show you up close. I'll see if I can put a clip, actually. And you might be able to see there's two points on either side. There's a red margin sometimes around the leaf, and there's obviously red polka dots, but it is quite small and it does stay relatively compact. Um, and it's just because of that that it kind of drew me to it, because I'm just like, ooh, this is not, your average looking begonia, and because it's so much smaller as well. And if I'm not mistaken, I think amphioxus is because it just means pointy on either end, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, amphi is on either side, and oxus. I would imagine, yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly that, that it's basically that it is pointy on either side of the actual plant. A leaf, sorry, even. But there was a lot of... And I might lean into this background section a bit more just to give you some of the history behind when people first started looking for this as well, is there was a, a concept that this is a plant that definitely needed a terrarium, all of these things, and it needed high humidity, it needed to be babied, all of these things. Same thing that would happen potentially sometimes with the Monstera oblique Peru when it was first coming out and it was really difficult to get it because obviously people wanted to give it the best chance. As both of these plants have become a bit more readily available, some of the opinions on the care that they definitely need rather than would be okay with has changed, basically. So, but I'll touch a bit more about that in care and accessories. But I think that's what I wanted to say for the background section. Let's move into the next topic. So a speed of growth with this plant, and it's an interesting one because I have grown this in several different conditions. I have grown this in um, a terrarium with the dart frogs at some point. I thought, <laughs> it just kind of makes sense in my head, so let's do that, basically. <laughs> uh, and that grew really, really fast. I've grown it in my conservatory, that grew really fast. I grew it in a household environment, and after it acclimated, and that's the important thing here, it grew really, really fast. So again, I'll benchmark this against the golden pothos. So if a golden pothos in the summer will bring out two or three new leaves a month, this one will probably do the same, if not more, actually. And in all fairness, in the summer, it will bloom quite heavily as well. So. Yeah, this is relatively fast growing begonia after it's a bit more established, basically. So it's got very fine roots as most begonias do. It's a very diminutive plant anyway, so it does take a while to get it to this level, but it's not too, too bad if, if I'm being honest in terms of how it gets to where it needs to get to, and it will grow quite nicely. When it does get happy, it will grow quite nicely. The one thing I will say is if you are transitioning it into regular humidity and not in a terrarium situation, what you might want to do is just assume that the plant is going to look half dead for about six months. Because roughly that's how much it might take. Three months to six months, this plant is going to look crispy, it's going to look unhappy, all of these things. If you can stick with it just looking a bit busted, it will essentially just snap into the kind of reality of everything and just go, ah, so I can throw a hissy fit and that doesn't change my environment. Okay, I'll acclimate to this. 
I know it's not, <laughs> that's not a biological way of looking at things, but a, these are the conversations that I'm hearing these plants have to themselves in my head. Might need to look into that. But, <laughs> but it is, it is a plant that will ultimately kind of get used to your environment as well. So, and I know obviously this conservatory is higher humidity than most people would have in their household, but I have grown this in regular household humidity. It just takes a beat to get used to it. And I've had touched on this topic on different videos that I've done. And a lot of the times in those situations is getting the watering just right. So I showed you a moment ago that the soil was bone dry on this. At that stage when I'm trying to acclimate it, I probably wouldn't want that to happen because that would stress the plant unnecessarily. When it's established and it's happy with it in its new environment and the lower humidity and all these things, feel free to try doing that and letting it go towards dry. And actually that is something that I have learned over the years with a lot of my begonias, both rhizomatous and cane begonias, because everybody just like, it needs to be evenly moist. You never need to let it dry out. I call bull on that one, basically, because I found when I did that, that's how I lost most of my begonias. The moment I started letting my begonias go dry, I'm not saying let my begonias go dry for a week or two when they're bone dry for a week or two, that would definitely stress them out because they've got very fine roots. But a day or two of dryness, I found they grow a bit happier. Both the rhizomatous and the cane begonias. So cane begonias would be things like the, um, oh, I'm a blocking, the begonia maculata whitei, kind of angel wingy kind of begonias. I mean, technically this is almost the same kind of thing. Um, I'm looking at my begonia melanobulata and that's a bit more, more rhizomatous one. The same thing goes with Chewy's, uh, Chewbacca 2.0 basically, there's Chewy that's over there and then there's Chewbacca 2.0, so my Begonia size Moria, which is more of a rhizomatous one, they all like to go a bit more dry, I find. So I went slightly off topic there, or very off topic in terms of kind of speed of growth, but yes, ultimately what I want to say is relatively fast, as fast as most other kind of vigorous growing Begonias or any other cane Begonias really. So moving on to ease of propagation. So this is an interesting one because I don't think this is talked about enough. I know there was originally mentions of this as well. This is a relatively easy begonia to propagate as long as, I want to see if, if I'd say if this is possibly, if you're going to try propagating begonia, if this should be your first one or not. Mm. I don't know, I'll give you some stories of how my propagates have gone with this particular plant. So let me give you in terms of substrates that I've used. So I've done uh, damp perlite, that worked really well. I don't think I've ever, oh no, I have. And I'm kind of looking at it at the moment. I don't know whether I'm gonna be able to pull it out. Give me a second, I'll see if I can pull it out. Scrap that, I'm not pulling that propagate out because it's growing through my plant shelves. And if I try to bring it out, it's probably gonna snap half the plant basically. Some of this plant got snapped as well when I was trying to bring it off the shelves because I don't know if you can see all the little frondy fronds that are going through. They they went through the, the grill part of the metal shelves behind. So trying to get that out whilst they're all trying to hook on because these things turn into little grappling hooks as you're trying to pull it out. Mm -mm. It was a mission and a half basically. But so I won't be doing it with that one. But I have propagated directly into pond as well. Damps sphagnum moss for the win with this one. It does really, really well with this one. I don't know if I've ever done it directly into soil. No, I think I have. And that work, soil or arid soil mix I'm talking about here, obviously. It's done really, really well. There is one thing that I will say when you come to propagating this, and this is the only way I have ever done it, but it has been really successful. It definitely needs a kind of either um, a clear plastic Ziploc bag, a propagation bin, it needs that high humidity environment when it's in that substrate in order for it to start rooting. It needs decent levels of light as well, so bright indirect light even when it's trying to root out and it will do really well. And this is the story that I wanted to tell you now. So, oh god, nearly two years ago now when I moved into, actually yeah, two years ago exactly, I moved into this house around kind of January time two years ago. Um, and I think in the previous uh, house that I was living in, 
I had taken at some point, because this is a plant that I'm always just like, oh, snip, snip a bit of the stem and put it in. And the other thing I will say about this, a lot of people are saying, you can put a leaf in, or a leaf with a petiole into it and it will root. Yes, but generally speaking, as with most begonias, if you give it some of the stem, it grows a lot faster and it grows a lot stronger. I have propagated it in all those ways and it does do it. But yeah, I would say, mm, yeah, try to get a bit of the stem. The other thing I will say, I'm going on all these different tangents. When I had this in my bio orb air terrarium with the dart frogs, they used to snap these things off all the time and they would drop into the terrarium, in the soil of the terrarium beneath it. Nine times out of 10, they would sprout out. So I put one or two stems in that terrarium. By the time I took it out of the terrarium at some point, because it was just getting way too big and then moved it here, uh, I think there was a cluster of about seven or eight growing points from the bottom and they were all about as tall as they were. So it is a kind of a cool begonia to be fair with that one. And, but yes, coming back to the original story, so two years ago when I moved, at some point obviously I'd taken a cutting of this, threw it in some damn sphagnum moss, put it in a Ziploc uh, clear plastic baggie, and it moved with everything else. What I hadn't realised, and if anybody's moved recently you know this, when you're trying to move everything into the house, there are one or two things that you ultimately just go, I'm just going to put this down here and deal with it when I've dealt with everything else. And you possibly discover that thing that you put down two years later. <laughs> Guess what I discovered two years later? Right in a south facing window. I don't know how I did not see this. It was amongst other plants as well. That Ziploc baggie that had not been opened that the sphagnum moss had almost, well, no, it wasn't almost, it was a bone dry by that point. And guess what was still green and growing inside of the baggie? That much of the begonia alpheoxus. So for anybody who says this can't be a relatively robust plant, that is something to bear in mind with that one. Now, uh, yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say about propagation relatively straightforward to propagate, you'd need to have your plant happy. So if you're transitioning it into that new environment, let it settle before you start taking cuttings and rooting them out. And in terms of rooting out, I would say two to three months to, for it to fully root out into whatever media you're growing it in. The other thing I will say, obviously, it is a begonia, it's got very fine roots. Whatever media you're growing it in, it's gonna be very difficult. Like for instance, sphagnum moss can be a pain to try to get off the roots enough to then move it into a different soil media. So just bear that in mind. Um, but yeah, it's two to three months and then you should be fine. It should be good, you should have new growth, you should have roots down below. Take a couple of cuttings if you're really worried, but yeah, really, really fine plant to grow. You only really need one or two leaves on that kind of node to get it in and you should be good to go. So let's move on to the next topic. Now, coming into availability. And this is one that we might want to dive into a bit more basically with this one. So yes, this used to be very, it used to be expensive. And by that, I would say mid to mid high double digits when I first found it. I did not pay that much money for it, I don't think. I did find, and it was also very difficult to find. I think I got it just before it started getting really expensive. Anyway, I don't think this was ever in the triple digits. I don't think, but at least here in the UK, there wasn't that many people that were growing it. So I found this on eBay and I got uh, an unrooted, mm, no, I think the same seller had an unrooted cutting and a rooted cutting. And I think I went for the rooted cutting and that was sent over. But for whatever reason, it really got bashed up in the post or it was really cold and things like that. And the plant really arrived to me and it was kind of pretty much mush, I think by the time it arrived to me. I did reach out to the seller. They were very, very good and they did have the unrooted cutting still that they hadn't sold. So they sent that to me as a substitute or maybe I paid a tiny amount of money for that plant, but not how much they were originally asking for or something along those lines. But ultimately the plant that did arrive to me that was unrooted cutting that I then had to root out was perfect condition. And that's the other thing I'm going to say about this plant, because I have seen it recently being sold in 
garden centers almost and in plant stores for a lot less. So we're looking at kind of small, 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 tiny bits of this plant. So maybe only that section there with maybe three or four leaves and probably only about this much of the plant in a tiny pot. You're probably looking at mid to high double digits there. Maybe if you get it slightly bigger, it might be very, very, very low double digits, basically. So that's the other thing I want to say. And this has been my experience. I did a giveaway a while back on my Instagram, and this was one of the plants that were in bundle of plants that went over to the giveaway winner. And I knew before I even sent this, <laughs> because I'd heard the same stories from everybody else. It wasn't just my experience. This ships like it's bad when it ships. It's so difficult. I've taken uh, a couple of cuttings, I think, of this down to the first plant swap in London. I don't remember if I did it for the second plant swap in London as well. But again, I'll give you an example with that one. It, it was a bundle of propagates and they'd all grown into the same moss and I'm just like, I could separate this, but I cannot be bothered. This will be one plant that somebody will trade <laughs> with me. The person that did get it, I think, was very happy with that fact. <laughs> But that was the one plant out of everything that I was transporting down in London myself, not through the postal service, was the one plant that I was worried was going to get bashed around and snapped and all these things. And to a certain point, it did. So these ship super badly, basically. The stems are very fragile. The leaves, the, the petioles that attach the leaves to the stem are very fragile. The leaves themselves are very fragile at snapping. However, the one thing I will say with this, and I did say this, and I'm hoping I've never really heard back, we were talking a bit back when that was first happening, um, with the person that won the giveaway. There was more than one plant, by the way, so it was one of many, basically, as in it wasn't just the Amphioxus. But at that point, I kind of said to her the same thing that a lot of other people will say when you're buying this plant, and we can give as many caveats as you want, but I don't think people quite grasp it as much you might just have to quickly just root it out again, basically, because as long as you've got a decent amount of stem on it, it will root out quite quickly and it will grow. It just really does not ship well. It is super fragile as a plant. And that was the, the point I was also trying to make. Even the ones in the garden center, the, obviously coming over from the Netherlands for them, they all look bruised and battered and they never look pristine. My humble opinion, I don't think they will ever look pristine when you're buying them from wherever you're buying them because it's difficult to ship them, they will look more pristine after a couple of months in your care. And as long as you're aware of that, I think that's something that you just need to be aware of. It's very, very difficult. It's with everybody's best intentions. This is not one plant that transports easily, basically. But yes, as I said, it was relatively expensive. It has come down considerably in price. It's become a lot more available, probably because it's as easy as it is to propagate. I don't know if there's still as much interest for this plant as there might have been a year or two ago, uh, because it at least here, it I don't want to say it flooded the market, but it was a lot more available than it ever had been before. But to be fair, I kind of see it. It's a very cool plant, and I'm glad that it was a bit more readily available to people to be able to purchase, because it's a cool begonia to have. It's just knowing some of these things and idiosyncrasies, then you're fine, basically. But yeah, let's move on to the next topic. Right, pests for this one. And this is an interesting one. I'm trying to think if I've ever actually had pests on this one. No meaty bugs. Maybe the occasional meaty bug, maybe. Uh, nothing that got out of control. Uh, and this was around a lot of other plants that did have a lot of mealy bugs. So that tells me something. I don't think I've ever had spider mites on this and I don't think this has ever had thrips. So I do wonder whether or not my little crazy internal thoughts that this looks like it could be like toxic is kind of true, whether or not even the bugs kind of leave this plant alone because it looks like it might be bad for them. And I love plants like that, and there's animals that do this as well, where they're kind of imitation plants. They don't have, um, they don't have the the harmful substances within themselves, but they look like other animals that do, potentially, or they give signals to other animals kind of going, don't touch me, I am probably not good for you, uh, even though 
they are harmless. They just imitate that kind of notion of a a bad pers a, a bad plant. But I don't know, sorry, random bit of commentary there. But yes, but pests with this one, I would almost say at least in my experience, not very many. So a plus. So coming into <laughs> care and uh, accessories for this one, <laughs> and I'll, I'll bring up the janky support sticks for the win here. <laughs> Plant ties, janky support sticks, and obviously if I wasn't, if I didn't have all of these tied up, this sprawls and it did look a bit really unkempt. The other thing that I will say about this plant is I mentioned about different growing media. It grows okay in pond with a water reservoir, even without the water reservoir when I was transitioning it into it. It's done really well in my traditional kind of aroid soil mix. It's done well, obviously, in pond. I've grew this plant very successfully for a very long period of time in just straight perlite. That was fine as well. Obviously treat it more like a semi-hydro plant at that point. But yeah, other than that, and as I was saying, you don't really need that high level of humidity to begin with. Some supports, this definitely doesn't need a moss pole, this just needs some sticks potentially to keep it up because it is a cane begonia and it will flop after it gets very, very top heavy when it gets larger, basically. The one thing I will say as well is it will lose, at least I have found in my experience, some of the lower leaves. So you might get situations like this where it's barren down at the bottom, but there's more leaves at the top. I don't know that has been my experience. It might just be because I, <laughs> I mistreat this plot. Also for the people that have been here for a while, this is the poster child for my feral plants. I'm kind of, at some point, the initial kind of excitement and spark after this many years for this plant has kind of disappeared. So I've kind of let it do its own thing. And if it dies off, I've got several little propagates that are kind of still bashing around in different propagation bins because I just let them there and they kind of do their own thing. So they're two years by the window and it's still nothing happened to it. It's fine. Don't think anybody would ever think I was going to say that I had a gonia that was feral. This one. This one right here? Feral. Um, so I don't know whether or not it's just my care that has meant that some of the lower leaves have dropped, but it's bushier at the top. It might be. I don't know. But yeah, overall, you don't need an awful lot of specialist care with this. Fertilize this the same way that you would anything else. And I think that is pretty much it, really. So coming into final thoughts with this one, and I'll start like I usually do with my final thoughts and say, if I didn't have this plant, knowing what I know now, would I get this plant? Yes, probably. Again, my caveat's always going to be the case of I don't have that much space. But because this can be quite small and it takes a while for it to get this ridiculous, basically, yeah, I probably would still get this. I would probably still put it in a terrarium because it looks cool with the other plants in there. I wouldn't do it at the moment because I no longer have the dart frogs, but in the terrarium that I was using for the dart frogs, I've now got uh, a crested gecko. And that is a lot heavier than the dart frogs. So it would probably snap this. I need sturdier plants for crested geckos because crested geckos are a bit heavier than dart frogs. <laughs> but... Yeah, I still love that kind of aesthetic that it does look like it could harm you. Um, and yeah, it doesn't grow particularly big. It does grow relatively fast. It is an easy propagator. So yeah, for me, I would definitely probably get it back into my collection generally, basically. Now, with the score that I usually give, so zero, one being the worst, 10 being the best, I'll give it two scores. I'll give it a begonia score and I'll give it an overall houseplant score. So for a begonia, I would give this an eight or a nine, just purely because out of most of the begonias I've owned, with the exception of maybe Chewbacca, my begonia size Moriae, this gives me very little hassle. And it's cool looking as well. Cane begonias are generally easier than rhizomatous, I have to say. But in terms of overall as a house plant, because it's got that difficulty transporting, because it can be a bit fragile, um, 
I'll take some points off, but I will give some points about the fact that it can be feral, the fact that after it does settle, it can grow quite happily in a lot of different conditions. Obviously, not super, super dry conditions, but regular household humidity should be okay for this plant. I, as an overall house plant, I'd give this a six or a seven probably leaning more towards the seven. So it's an interesting one. And if you can get your hands on one and you're interested in begonias, this is a cool little plant to kind of potentially add to your collection. But yeah, let me know if you've got this plant, what your experiences have been down below. I think it's gonna be a mixed bag, possibly in the comments with this one in terms of how people's experiences have been with this. I might be completely surprised and everybody Everybody else's experience have been entirely opposite to mine or the same as mine. I don't know. We shall see. Um, but yeah, do let me know down below. As always, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.